thank you so much for coming out in this awful weather. <clears throat> a lot of people are wondering about what happened to the art world. From painters, to viewers, to art critics. Even at the New York Times, Roberta Smith and Holland Cotter, both of whom I think have contributed to the problem by accepting so much that is shock or schlock value, even they are now concerned. Here's Holland Cotter in a recent review of an Ad Reinhardt show. Quote, and tell me, where are the artists today who care enough about art, as it was Reinhardt's life, to look around, see what we all see, an art world sick with greed and arrogance and soul-killing smallness, and say so out loud. And Roberta Smith, reporting on the recent November auctions, wrote, auctions have become the leading indicator <clears throat> of ultra-conspicuous consumption, pieces of public male-dominated theater in which collectors, art dealers, and auction houses flex their monetary clout, mostly for one another. The spectacle of watching these privileged few tossing around huge numbers, huge numbers of money become a rarefied spectator sport. These events are painful to watch yet impossible to ignore, and deeply alienating if you actually love art for its own sake. November 13th, 2013. These two remarks <clears throat> mention caring about and loving art for its own sake. Positive notions that are in short supply in much of what passes for art making, art viewing, and art talk today. For instance, we learn that in many art schools, young people are now taught primarily how to talk about their work. Talking about the work has become more important than the work itself. The belief is that you can put anything over if the talk is good enough. The opposite of what Flaubert once said, Flaubert, the more words there are in a gallery wall next to a picture, the worse the picture. <laughs> but what art has become is something that is talked up, explained by those who are still called artists. However, most don't conform to the dictionary meaning of the word. Somebody who creates art, especially paintings, drawings, and sculpture. Networking, too, in graduate school has become more important than what you might learn about painting sculpture or whatever else it is people do nowadays. It's well known that if your parents can afford 51000 per year for the two-year graduate program in fine arts at Columbia, you'll probably have your work viewed by the New York gallery dealers at your MFA show uptown. $100,000 to get a first show. Not that bad. But a blatant reminder of the growing distance between the rich and everyone else that we keep reading about and that de Blasio became mayor highlighting. Then think about what are considered the most valuable works of our time. Where does love for art as, it, as itself come into responding to a blown up, orange colored balloon like sculpture of a dog. This particular dog sold for $58.4 million a few months ago. What does that have to do with art? Defined in Merriam Webster as something that is created with imagination and skill and that is beautiful or that expresses important ideas or feelings. Where is the beautiful or important idea or feeling in looking at a stenciled sign in block letters on a white ground from the movie Apocalypse Now by Christopher Wall? It reads, sell the house, sell the car, sell the kids. 
He's having a retrospective at the Guggenheim right now. I thought this work looked like a sign you might have seen in a college art studio in 1975. In an article in the New Republic, the super rich are ruining art for the rest of us, Jed Pearl called this particular canvas vacuous Dadaist signage. But no, it's a 64, no sorry, 26.4 million dollar object sold in the November auctions. And looking at art <clears throat> my whole life, I had absolutely no response to it other than boredom. The same response I had to the 13 Reinhardts, <clears throat> the black paintings that Holland Cotter so heatedly praised above, although they were better than the sign. I had first seen the black paintings when I was a grad student at Hunter in 1965. Reinhardt taught there. I remember walking into the Jewish Museum desperately wanting to like the work and then absolutely not liking it. This was repeated almost 50 years later at Zwerner Gallery a few months ago. Again, I wanted to like the black Reinhardts, but after seeing his matte black surfaces, there was nothing much to look at. And I had re reason to be interested in them, as I'd done nothing but black paintings from 1992 to 1998. I think the wrong Reinhardts are being featured, the dull ones. While his wonderful red and blue series from the early 50s when he was friendly with Rothko are being ignored. No one was looking at the 13 black paintings the day I went to Zwerner's. There were a few people in the gallery, but they were all looking at his cartoons. Then there's the Warhol phenomena. I defy anyone to show me what's visually significant or moving about looking at a black and white, unique, hand-painted Warhol, as Christie's advertised it, of a Coca-Cola bottle. Now, the most expensive Warhol ever sold at auction for $57 million. It's okay. Not badly drawn, a, a sort of rendering, but great art. And who has made less demand on the audience than Warhol? To my mind, Warhol has had the most mystifying success of the recent past. A success which seems the result of influential types in the art world simply making a decision to like Warhol. Sometimes now, he's even mentioned in the same breath as Michelangelo and Pollock. Nothing in the work inherently seems worthy of those comparisons. Clement Greenberg believed that things would change over time. He'd seen the soppy canvases of Bouguereau, the biggest artist in the late 19th century, denounced by later generations. He thought the same would happen with Warhol and others. But so far, since Greenberg's death in 1994, prices have only gone higher. Claims become more exalted. So that Jed Pearl, in the article I just mentioned, took the position that, quote, art is just another hope to be abandoned, unquote. Within three generations, we've gone from a critic who thought the market, as in the past, would correct itself over time, to one who thinks there is no longer reason for hope in the art world. And really, how can you compare the Coke bottle to, say, Matisse's great piano lesson of 1916? Hand-painted and with color. Matisse could create this unprecedented, commanding masterpiece because in addition to talent, he had amazing taste. Taste that was not dated so that the judgments he made in that painting 98 years ago still resonate for us today. For a moment, I'm going to go back in time and talk briefly about Arthur Schopenhauer and before him, Immanuel Kant and their work in aesthetics. 
In around 1870, Schopenhauer developed the world as will and representation. Here I'm quoting from an article about his work. This is from Schopenhauer, <clears throat> a, a book about him. We lead ordinary, practical lives in a kind of bondage to our own desire. This bondage is a source not merely of pain, but also of cognitive distortion in that it restricts our attention to those aspects of things relevant to the fulfilling or thwarting of our desires. Aesthetic contemplation being willless allows us desire-free glimpse into the essence of things as well as a respite from desire-induced pain. <clears throat> For the moment that one is in pure contemplation, we are raised above willing, above all desires and care. We are, so to speak, rid of ourselves. Kant earlier in his critique of judgment from 1790, he used the term beautiful as opposed to pretty. To identify the beautiful, one calls into play the judgment of taste. Kant regarded taste as a faculty for judging everything in respect to which we can communicate our feelings to all other human beings. He called taste in art the faculty of estimating an object of, or mode of representation by means of delight or aversion apart from self-interest. He claimed that contemplating something beautiful triggers the free play of imagination and understanding. He believed that many are talented, but few have the necessary taste with which to judge their own work. The feelings of awe and excitement, the ability to lose oneself that we get from looking at beautiful art made by other human beings, including our contemporaries, is a lot to give up. For what? Decapitated chickens? Artists slicing themselves with razor blades? And what will happen over time in a world where contemporary artists no longer attempt to make beautiful art? For me, one of the problems with pop art is that it does not attempt to be beautiful. Art critic Hilton Kramer said, with the eruption of the pop art movement, an element of demystification came into the art world, an element of cynicism, an element of anything goes. I've looked at Warhol's gold Marilyn Monroe painting so many times at MoMA and always turn away in disgust. For me, there's nothing to look at. And once you know it's not real Brillo boxes, but fake ones, that piece isn't interesting either. <clears throat> David Swerner, in a generally smug interview that you might have read uh, in the recent New Yorker, did say a few disarming things. At one point, he talked about having the Brillo boxes around as a kid and hiding behind them. I could see they'd be good for that. Or draping your coat over. Do collectors really spend time at home looking at these things? The way, say, Paul Mellon was purported to, or Henry Frick, or Albert Barnes? I think it was Mellon who had a whole separate apartment set up where he could go in the evening to contemplate his pictures. Now it would be, I think I'll sit down and look at that Coke bottle again, honey. The common <laughs> knowledge is that collectors now acquire not for love or because they care, but for investment, which will work as long as there are good enough explainers to tout this novelty art. But when they're not around anymore, is that shark in formaldehyde going to be worth the $12 million Stephen Cohn paid Damien Hirst for it? There's a new book by a British art critic, Julian Spaulding, that addresses the question. It's titled, Con Art, 
why you ought to sell your Damien Hurst while you can. <laughs> the current scene in what used to be the visual arts is so much about belief, so little about seeing. In its frenzy, it shares something, I think, with the quest for the holy relics in the Middle Ages. The nobility and high up representatives of the clergy would run around Europe spending inordinate sums of money, as the super rich do now, on chalices, nails, crowns of thorn, pieces of wood that were purported to be Christ's. There was even a foreskin relic called the Holy Prepus. They'd buy these often competing against each other and then carry their trophies back to churches in France and Italy, where they still sit with so much less credibility. There was also the 17th century tulip frenzy in Holland, tulip mania, where thousands of people made and lost fortunes overnight speculating in tulips. In our world, the very notion of what art is has lost all meaning. As Kramer implied, anything can now be viewed as art, from disemboweled bulls and sheep to spare ribs. And many museums seem to delight in sponsoring weird, often unsafe events which attempt to expand the definition of the meaning art. On the tamer side, MoMA had an open microphone installed on a, in its first floor in 2010, which visitors were encouraged to scream into. As you might guess, scream piece had to do with a celebrity. In that case, Yoko Ono. A side note, the noise was completely disrespectful to anyone who came to the museum to actually look at a painting. In 2011, the new museum had a giant slide installed, which people were intended to slide down. Why was this in a place called a museum and not a park? Then there are the food, bee, and pollen artists. Klaus Weber, who trained as a member in the class of 1996 at Berlin University of the Arts, had no teacher. A class critical of the traditional master-teacher model was run by the students themselves. With this great preparation, in 2009, Weber did a series of bee paintings where bright white canvases varying in size were, any ideas? Splattered with bee defecation and then shown at the Freeze Art Fair. Question, if the bee makes the painting, is the bee an artist? And what's the value of opening the definition of the word art to include stunts like this? How is it enhanced for either the viewer or the purchaser? I think the audience is starving for what used to be called art painting and sculpture made by human beings who knew how to make something. Why rob the public of what art has always provided? And you might have noticed there is a complete disconnect now between the floors in a museum for so-called contemporary art and those that show art prior to 1960. In the latter, we see people engaged in looking. The galleries have a soothing calm about them. In the contemporary wing, it often feels like you've just wandered into a foreign country where no one speaks your language. Or skit night at summer camp. And now from the last section, chapter 36, <clears throat> collectors and dealers. The type of person I'd known with elegance, taste, interest in art, and money hardly exists anymore. Like certain Cheever characters whom one no longer sees walking around on the Upper East Side. For instance, the Hirschlands. Paul, from a major German banking family. Ellen, the niece 
of the great Matisse collectors, both Ellen and Paul were raised among masterpieces. Escaping Germany in 1939, Paul carried the family's Tintoretto, Moses among the bulrushes, over the German border wrapped in newspaper. Later, he sold it to the Metropolitan Museum, where you can see it hanging now in the Renaissance room. Now that they are gone, the collection is divided among their three children, none of whom collect. And there were others, Joseph Hirshhorn, with a great and developed eye, who put together a museum full of contemporary art, and Paul Mellon, founder of the National Gallery in Washington, or the great Medici collector, Lorenzo de' Medici, patron to contemporary artists of his own time, like Michelangelo and Botticelli. Where are their equals now? Those who go by the name often seem more interested in art attainment. They are often, as I've said, Wall Street types whose flouting of the rules sometimes puts them under scrutiny. Or families like the Nomads, with a collection on, with a gallery on Madison and 76th Street, whose collection of impress, impressionist and contemporary art has been used by the son Helly for a hundred million dollar money laundering scheme. The younger Skian was caught on tape giving this advice. You just be like, oh yeah, I bought it, you know, a Picasso drawing for a hundred thousand or something. He's pleaded guilty to illegal gambling and is waiting to be sentenced. The scandals come quickly now, one after the other, as do the lawsuits. Recently, Glafira Rosales, who provided forged paintings to Nodla Gallery, was arrested and pleaded guilty. And Friedman, the former president of Nodler, whom I'd always instinctively detested, turns out to have been selling fake paintings. Neither Rosales nor the pictures had any provenance. Nodler, which before it closed had been the oldest gallery in America, now has more than six lawsuits against it. The fakes, which were acquired in the low millions, had no resale value whatsoever. That's when things started heating up. I'd known Anne when she was a front desk secretary at Emmerich Gallery. Somehow she'd managed to propel herself from that to running the oldest gallery in New York. The way she met the Long Island woman was through Jamie Andrade, a short, well-manicured guy from South America, who when you went there was always in the main room of Nodler wearing a vest. He'd chat up anyone who walked in. It was never clear exactly what his job was. It's he who introduced Friedman to Glafira Rosales and her boyfriend, Jose Bergantinos Diaz. Jamie Andrade from Colombia brought down the house of Nodler. The beautiful brownstone, which is shuttered up now, closed after 165 years. I think Friedman had to know something was up because the differential, what she allegedly paid for each work, for instance, 600,000 for a Clifford Still that was sold for 4.3 million, or 750,000 for Pollock that sold, <clears throat> that sold for two million was just too great. But even after the alleged 47 Pollock that you might have seen reproduced in the newspaper, tested fake because the pigment on the canvas hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> Friedman insisted publicly it was authentic. I didn't think she was going to get away with it. After the Daedalus Foundation, which handles the Motherwell estate, said the work in question was not by Motherwell, in fact stamped it not by Motherwell, and Friedman said it was. When asked why she hadn't bothered to check out Rosalie's credentials, Anne said, I don't do that. I thought the scholarship was more important than hiring investigators. What scholarship? In all, dozens of forgeries were sold by Nodler, 
for more than $80 million. The back story turns out to be more outrageous than any of us in New York had imagined. If someone had said, I bet a Chinese immigrant who studied at the Art Students League is turning out these forgeries in Queens, we all would have laughed. But that's exactly what was happening. In a garage of a nondescript house in Woodhaven for a few thousand dollars each, the obviously talented Pai Shen Kwan could make a Pollock, a Motherwell, a Still, a Rothko, look quite a bit like an original, enough so, so that many people were fooled. And the copyist, who is now in Shanghai, fortunately, told Bloomberg News the other day that he had no idea the pieces were being marketed as original. He thought the copies were sold to art lovers who couldn't afford the actual paintings. It wasn't he who signed the paintings. It was Bergantino's Diaz who forged the final signatures. It's funny that people like Frank Stella and E.A. Carmine claimed in print that the paintings were original. One even hung in the American Embassy in Romania and later was purchased by the American ambassador to Romania, Nicholas Taubman, for $4.3 million. It was also Burgundinos Diaz who found the unknowing forger in the village in the early 90s. I think he was in the village art fair, not a real art fair, the, the lesser. From 94 to 2009, he turned out 60 fakes in all. Clearly, this could not last, as the estates of the great abstract expressionists are carefully watched. Each time one was sold and the replica was shown to the estate, it was rejected. Bergantinos Diaz, who, is, who it turned out had a spotty record even prior to the scam, has left the country. So far, only Rosales has been arrested, and Friedman and her lawyer spend their days fending off irate galleries and individuals who want their money back. Then there is a collector I mentioned before, Mr. Cohn, called Stevie in the art world. He ran a billion dollar hedge fund where his traders lined up periodically to feed him insider tips without ever directly stating where the information came from. Cohn, sometimes referred to in print as the great white whale, so far has avoided being captured because he is extremely cautious. His company though, SAC, has finally pleaded guilty to insider trading and securities fraud and agreed to pay $1.8 billion as a fine. Numbers relating to Cohn and his transactions are in the stratosphere. U.S. Attorney Brett Baraha said about the company, SAC has fostered an unprecedented culture of corporate corruption. Is Cohn a man who can actually see an individual painting? Is he capable of the feelings that great art always inspires? I don't think so. Isn't it rather a question of each new purchase being one more status symbol, one more thing to trade, or in some cases, as I said, simply art attainment? As Michael Finley, a director at Aquavella, where Cohn recently purchased Picasso's dream, wrote to me, a great deal of what passes for art is really light entertainment. The money, however, is heavy. Unfortunately, it is billionaires, sometimes corrupt, who have been a primary influence in the art market lately. In fact, the dealer, David Zwerner, when asked in an interview by Businessweek about Cohn, said, I would say he's certainly a friend of the gallery, and I wouldn't want to talk about him in any other way than that. In the past, art critics were the ones who conferred legitimacy. Greenberg Pollock, Fried Stella, 
Zola, Manet, Baudelaire, Delacroix. But most art critics now simply do not judge. Then too, the art world has morphed into the art market, which has become the plaything of the super rich. Denver, David Zorner, also on Business Week, said, quote, the art market is not just the trade of goods, it's a lifestyle, unquote. He continued on this theme in the New Yorker piece 12 to 13, quote, in 2009, everything fell apart, values came down, and I thought, shit, this is going to be rough. This is going to last years. But the structures in the art world were absolutely intact. We all flew to the fairs, showed up for the dinners. Collectors weren't buying, but they were there. They were in our net. When I saw the mechanisms in place, and I saw the pull that what we do has on people's lives, they don't want to miss out. It's the greatest couples therapy. Thank you.